Satan, 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 our Lord and Master. I acknowledge thee as my God and Prince. I promise to serve and obey thee as long as I shall live. I renounce the other God and all the saints. If you consider what you're allowed to do, what you should do, almost by default, you consider what you shouldn't or can't. And these things are meant to have a fascination. You should challenge these things. If you find yourself as a thinking person, finding religion and the consensual view of virtue and whatever else to be scary and in some sense it's deeply immoral, then again, by default, you're kind of cast in with the rest of the, sort of the, the devil's disciples. <laughs> There are a lot of misconceptions about Satanism. I mean, the first thing to say is that it's specifically a modern phenomenon. Historically, modern means post-Renaissance. So it has its roots in literature. Characters like Lord Byron, later on, let's say, the decadents like Baudelaire, created an idea which is essentially a kind of Gothic militant atheism. There's a distinct difference between that and what you might term devil worship. Devil worship is the idea where you take a specific uh, myth structure, Christianity, uh, principally in this case, and you turn it on its head and all of its heroes become villains and vice versa. Je renonce à Jésus-Christ, à ses pompes et à ses œuvres, et je m'attache à Lucifer pour toujours. Uh, Satanism's more of a, it's a lifestyle, a philosophy, it's all these different kinds of things. It's not really a belief system. Satanists uh, in any real sense of the word, don't believe in a literal Satan. Uh, the Satan of the Satanists is as real as things like market forces or public opinion, all these things that have a huge impact on the world but aren't really there. Most people imagine without thinking about it that the version of Satan and the Lucifer myth and all these kind of things is from somewhere in the Bible. It's not. There's very little that's obviously about Satan, a lot of its mistranslation, a lot of its supposition and so forth. What we get is from a, a, a poetic epic called Paradise Lost, and that gave us the version of the devil as this kind of doomed anti-hero, this ultimate rebel. And the irony is, of course, that uh, Paradise Lost was written by a, a, a pious poet, a chap called Milton, who was writing this to try and explain to the common people what Christian morality was about, where we came from, and how it all happened. So clearly this wasn't designed as a sort of PR job for Satan, but that's what it ended up being. <laughs> If you're interested in passion, if you're interested in imagination, creation, these are all satanic characteristics. And to a certain extent, when um, Milton wrote Paradise Lost, it's almost as if Satan sort of escaped between the pages. Once you turn this into a, a real story, you start to realise that there are a lot more connections between us and this rebellious angel than there are between us and this kind of absurd stern father figure who we're supposed to sort of, you know, pats us on the head when we're good and smacks us in the chops when we're not. cliches of modern Satanism were established by a writer called Dennis Wheatley, who's a character who used to be everywhere. Nowadays you'll find a few of his novels here and there in your local Oxfam charity shop. But during the 70s he was huge, translated into dozens of different languages, uh, you know, the equivalent of John Grisham or Stephen King today. Now, Wheatley's idea of Satanists came principally from two sources. 
One of these was uh, the great beast Alistair Crowley. And the two knew each other because they both had this kind of bluff English gentleman shtick going. They got on famously. The other is the works of an extraordinary character called Montague Summers, who wrote all of the influential material on witchcraft, Satanism, vampires, werewolves in the early, early 20th century. And his particular angle, which is interesting, is that all of this stuff was not only true, literally true, the devil existed, witches cast spells, vampires rose from graves, but also that the Inquisition, uh, the Catholic clergy, which he himself felt he represented, were entirely justified in burning all of these people, staking them or whatever else. And Wheatley picks up these bits and pieces and creates these Satanists as being these impossibly decadent, often foreign, uh, weak-willed and jaded thrill-seekers who are dabbling with things which they shouldn't. And this became almost like um, impacted upon satanic culture. People picked up on this and thought, well, this sounds rather fun. Ritualism is obviously at the core of pretty much all religion, um, not surprisingly, because I suggest it's at the core of pretty much all of our lives. So much of how we understand the world is to do with various rituals. Of course, that's not very exciting, and the more exciting version of this are deviant rituals, forbidden rituals, and the archetypal one is the Black Mass. Now, the Black Mass was um, a magical practice the idea being that if the Catholic Mass was the most powerful form of magic within the Catholic Church, perhaps we can sort of shift some of that power by uh, inverting things. The archetypal Black Mass, which uh, rose to prominence at the court of the Sun King in France, uh, involved a, the classic version, which is a female, a naked female, as the altar. So what you're doing is you're deifying lust. It's basically sort of blasphemy for fun and profit. It's a justification for misbehaviour. Of course, in Satanism proper, most of these things aren't misbehaviour. And so the Black Mass is, is, isn't really uh, celebrated by real Satanists very often, unless, of course, somebody arrives and says, you know, I'd love you to conduct a Black Mass. Here's a bag full of money, at which point it would become a... It'd be silly not to. <laughs> Edward Alexander Crowley was the son of a member of a brewing dynasty who made Crowley's Ales and was also a member of a rather austere Protestant sect known as the Plymouth Brethren. Uh, his father died when he was relatively young. He had an awful time at the Plymouth Brethren school and Crowley, who was clearly very, very bright, decided to change his name to Alistair Crowley because he thought that was more conducive to greatness for various reasons. And when he hit Cambridge University and eventually was beyond the reach of his uh, pious mother and various teachers, he started experimenting with things like the occult and magic. Crowley's a titan in the occult world. He just, I mean, so many different roads you follow lead you to Crowley, and whatever you might think about him, I think it's difficult to deny that he was a man of rare genius. There was something very interesting. He, he was a brilliant climber. He was um, a more talented poet than most people will allow. He, his his knowledge and scholarship was very wide-ranging, even if it was, you know, pretty deviant at certain levels. The peak of, if you like, Crowley's powers and influence, we're talking about the, the early 1900s, maybe through till 1920, 1930. He becomes this kind of tabloid villain. Some people argue the first ever tabloid villain. So various newspapers uh, take great pleasure in uh, coming up with headlines like The Wickedest Man in the World, which is often repeated, or Man We'd Like to Hang is another one. Uh, Crowley quite gets off on this notoriety, uh, you get the impression, and starts creating his own religion, which is consciously or otherwise a parody of Christianity. It uh, makes everything that Christianity preaches as bad 
to be its sacraments, so sex, uh, drugs, blasphemy, all become these sacred acts within his particular religion. It reached its apex, or its nadir, if you like, at a little farmhouse in Sicily, which he named the Abbey of Thelema, where the, the holy word was, uh, do what thou wilt. Crowley becomes a, a particularly interesting figure for pop and rock stars, I think, in the 60s and 70s. Because in Crowley, you have this character who obviously is very sexually magnetic, even in his latter years when he kind of looks like an, uh, you know, an angry Humpty Dumpty. He still has all of these beautiful young women hurling themselves at his feet. He's a guy who's gone right to the edge. In the 60s, the whole rock star or rock god thing is very new. And it's easy to forget now how weird it must have looked to people, particularly older people, when they saw these people becoming literally hysterical in a way in which people only ever did previously at religious revivalist meetings. So this is weird shit that's going on here. And it's not just weird shit for the people looking at the audiences, and presumably for the audiences themselves, but it's also weird shit, if you think about it, for the guys who are being worshipped. If you imagine, let's say you're, I don't know, 18 or 19, and you're motivated by the things which motivate most of us when we're 18 or 19, you want to score some interesting drugs, maybe. You certainly want success with a member of the opposite sex, the same sex, or whatever happens to float your boat. If these things not only arrive, but actually quite literally in many cases, thrust up your nose, what do you want anymore? And I think Crowley was a sort of, he, these postcards that he sent back from the edge spoke to these people because here was someone else who'd been through this. Here was someone else who'd sort of experienced uh, uh, this sort of getting all of his appetite satisfied. And so you get characters like uh, Jimmy Page, and Led Zeppelin, who perhaps were the archetypal rock god band, if you like. But you also get people like um, David Bowie, who, when he went through his difficult phase, became preoccupied by uh, Crowley, and uh, if the stories are true, also became thoroughly paranoid due to sort of cocaine abuse and started to believe all of this magical stuff was happening around him. And that still goes on. I mean, he's a, he's a big influence, for example, on Marilyn Manson, but also on a lot of other bands. I mean, you hear more and more bands name-checking Crowley, but also name-checking Crowley not just as this bogeyman that he was in the 60s and 70s, but more and more as this character who had a, an interesting thing to say about this, that and the other. I mean, he is fascinating. <laughs> Anton LaVey is, I think without doubt, the most influential figure in modern Satanism. He's a fascinating and very controversial character whose background was basically in the carnies and circuses. Pretty much everything about LaVey has been challenged, argued, and so forth. Uh, according to LaVey, he was a uh, lion tamer at one point, a roustabout in the carnies, uh, and used to play uh, keyboards in various uh, strip bars and so forth. In fact, he listed his, his sort of dark on the road to Damascus, if you like, as being when he discovered that uh, the travelling uh, evangelical Christian tents he'd play organ for on Sunday were playing for the same audiences as the sort of burlesque tents that he was playing for the following Friday, and the people were hypocritical. The Church of Satan was officially founded in 1966. It's a club for non-joiners, so there's always been that tension of, uh, you know, how can you get all these individualists in one room together and is there any point to it? Uh, but he decided that, if nothing else, the ritual aspects of it were fun. These were psychodramas. LeVay was very flamboyant. I mean, people sort of describe him dismissively as a sort of carnival huckster. But LeVay was never... Uh, he never denied those roots. In fact, if anything, they're central to his version of Satanism. He sort of sees the world to a certain extent as being like a carny where everyone's sort of got different pitches and is sort of selling this nonsense and that nonsense and has, you know, you know roll up, roll up, you know, uh, eternal life, all you have to do is pay us all your cash and all these different kind of things. 
And for LeVay, the Satanist is the person, is, is the carny, is the guy who knows that most of this stuff is completely false, that life is a, 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 a collection of different illusions, uh, consensual realities, however you want to put, put it. And that, you know, the Satanist sort of takes advantage of this. Uh, the whole thing kind of gradually built up as it uh, provided a lot of good copy for local and then increasingly the national press. Uh, and in 1969, he was approached by um, uh, an editor at Avon Books and asked if he would like to write a satanic Bible. So LeVay put together these various elements into a book which most people now regard as being largely common sense with a good dose of sort of a, a blasphemous outrage thrown in and various other bits and pieces. But this is a book which formed a, uh, a, a contact point for lots of young kids. It's more than one sort of Satanist has put it. You don't really need the Church of Satan. All you need to do is pop down to your local branch of Borders or whatever and pick up a copy of this and it's pretty much in there. Even if you think LeVay is a complete fraud, even if you think that LeVay preached uh, proto-fascism, even if you think all of these things, the fact that remains that he is a fascinating character who clearly had his finger on a particular pulse, a particular point in history. Most of the Satanists who I think, you know, I could respect today are increasingly of the opinion that the, the black arts are the arts impacting upon someone's uh, consciousness at a distance of tens of thousands of miles using a film is just as powerful as doing the same using a sort of a magic circle and a wand. The devil and uh, the cinema have had kind of parallel histories in many ways. If you get the devil at all in early American cinema, he's very much a folkloric figure, the kind of guy in fairy tales and folk tales who, uh, you know, meets with the devil and manages to trick him in some way. It's very light-hearted. <laughs> The real leap forward uh, comes in 1968-69 uh, when Roman Polanski, at that time a sort of, you know, kind of a, 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 the young up-and-coming star of, of, you know, international cinema and, and director, makes, takes a best-selling novel by a guy called Ira Levin called Rosemary's Baby. And Polanski's chief riff, his thing he's best at, uh, is this suffocating ambience of paranoia. One of the things that made uh, Rosemary's Baby particularly interesting was that it, it also tipped over into the real world in as much as they employed Anton LaVey uh, in a publicity capacity. You know, he'd show up at cinemas in his full sort of, you know, satanic regalia with some of his fans and hand out, I think it was badges or leaflets or something, saying, pray for the soul of Anton LaVey. Um, there's also, uh, and this is like so much about LeVay, very controversial. It's said that LeVay played the devil in the, the satanic rape sequence. Uh, Rosemary's Baby was a big hit and was both regarded artistically and commercially as a viable picture, which then opens the door for all of these other Hollywood versions. Uh, perhaps the most significant, and I think morally repugnant of these, is The Exorcist. The Exorcist is Catholic propaganda. It basically was designed to frighten people back into the churches, which it kind of did. Suddenly, exorcism was hot again, and all these poor neurotic people were allowed to say all the naughty words they liked and, uh, you know, whatever else. And then the clergyman could feel powerful, you know, and, and like superheroes and casting out the devil. I mean, the sad uh, after effect of this, of course, is that a lot of people were badly traumatised, uh, in some cases injured and even killed during these various exorcisms. Most previous horror cinema, with the exception significantly, I think, of Rosemary's Baby and The Seventh Victim and films like that, but most horror cinema previous to that have been very gothic. And one of the things that gothic means is there's a certain distance from this. It's at an exotic time or place. So with Hammer horror films, it's at some unspecified period in the mid-1800s. And often it's somewhere else. It's Transylvania, it's, you know, all these imaginary places. 
And what you get with uh, The Exorcist is it's very much placed in contemporary society. It's very much something that people can relate to. And I also think it pushed the envelope in terms of what was legitimate to show. It was a big studio. That kind of stuff, previously, you'd be lucky to see in anything except the most tawdry uh, exploitation film. You know, they think it's worth the risk, because if it comes off, you know, it'll sell twice as many copies or twice as many people will see it. With The Exorcist, you have this, you know, this transgressive imagery, which is legitimised by it being, both by it coming from a major studio and with these sort of, you know, respected names involved, but also by the way in which it sort of has this kind of Christian or this religious justification. And, I mean, the chief conflict between the writer, Blatty, and Freak and the director was they were two, doing two different things. And uh, Blatty saw it very much as a, a sort of theological debate. And uh, Freakin saw it as a, as a roller coaster ride. <laughs> And the last film, to a certain extent, that came in this sort of unholy trinity, if you like, is The Omen. And The Omen kind of hangs between the two. The guy who put it together had a friend who was a born-again Christian. And this born-again Christian was coming out with all the nonsense from revelations about the, you know, the badgers with seven heads and the exploding virgins, or whatever else. I mean, you know, the Book of Revelations, lots of fun. Absolute nonsense. But this, you know... the. He's a, a fundamentalist Christian, and fundamentalist Christians believe that everything in the Bible is literally true. And so he's coming up with stuff, and it's happening. And this guy's thinking, this is a paranoid fantasy. Wouldn't it make a great horror movie? And so um, if The Exorcist popularised exorcism for a while, uh, The Omen did things like, for example, uh, the number 666, which I believe subsequent research has shown to be inaccurate, but that launches into the popular consciousness. I mean, the reason the devil has all the best tunes is, to a certain extent, all of the things which Christianity has put onto the devil's shoulders, tits and blood, I suppose, being uh, a good way of, you know, eros and thanatos, if you prefer, uh, are the things which we find fascinating as, you know, as individuals. <laughs> It's about the indoor and the outdoor, sex and death. How do we get here? Where are we going? <laughs> because the devil is about these kind of things, I think inevitably all of the, sort of the best tunes, the best films, uh, the best novels have a little bit of that wickedness in them. <laughs> The opposite of Christian faith or Muslim faith or Buddhist faith or Wiccan faith is always doubt. And that's what the devil's about. The devil's about entertaining you. The devil's about that moment when you suddenly think, well, actually, yeah, bloodshed is kind of funny. That point at which you think, well, I shouldn't sleep with her, but what the hell? That's what the devil's about. We've all got some of that. Mm -hmm.